Good morning and a very warm welcome to everybody who's uh, joined us today for the Hertfordshire Young People's Coronavirus webinar. This is the second of the webinars that we've had designed to help everybody, uh, particularly the young people, to understand more about the coronavirus, uh, to, le to allay some of the concerns that they have and to answer the questions that you have been submitted to us already. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, the panel today. We have Dr. Alison Freighter, the public health consultant uh, for children and young people in Hertfordshire. We have uh, Liz Shapland, the Deputy Education Services Director at Hearts for Learning, who are our uh, support organisation and who do a brilliant job for young people and education in Hertfordshire. We have Ta Tanya Rawl, the head of school standard and accountability for education, children and services. Um, and that's the education side of Hertfordshire County Council. And Anne Malloy, who is the British Sign Language Interpreter. So hello and welcome to you all this morning. And we'll be introducing you a little bit later on for your presentations. Uh, the aim of today's event is to provide an overview of COVID-19. To update, to update you on what's happening in Hertfordshire, to address some of the issues and questions raised by young people, and we've had a number already submitted, and to let you know where you can find reliable information in the future. Should you need to use subtitles, please ensure that these are switched on on your viewing device. The webinar will last for just about an hour, and there will be an opportunity for you to pose questions in the questions box, uh, which you will see on the right of your screen. And if we don't have time to pick those all up as we go through, we will make sure that we get the answers out afterwards. I want to thank all of you who have sent us in questions over the last couple of weeks. We have received more than 30 questions in advance. So we'll do our best to cover all of those as much as possible during the course of the next hour. The webinar is being hosted with brand new technology for us. So should there be any technical glitches, we will make sure that the information addressing the questions that young people have sent in prior to today are posted on www.justtalk.org, justtalkhearts.org. And there's two T's in the middle of that. So I'm going to repeat it, www.justtalkhearts.org. This session will also be recorded so anyone that misses it will be able to access it after the event on the Just Talk website. I really do hope that you will find today's session informative, helpful and allay some of the concerns that I absolutely understand that you may have. I'm just going to turn before we introduce or I introduce uh, Dr. Alison Freighter to Ian Usher, who is behind the scenes, just to check if he has anything to add from a technology point of view. Ian? Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Terry. Um, just to say, if you have issues with connecting, uh, then do point to the uh, help button down there. That's got four stages that should help you connect. Um, if you want to view everything full screen, then look over here to the full screen button. It looks like a little white square just to the right of the chat, just to the left of the chat, sorry. Um, and if you've got any questions, as Terry has said, do please do put them in the questions uh, panel. In the questions panel, if you see a question that you want, uh, you really think, yeah, that's my question too, you can upvote it and the panel will then know um, uh, that it's a question that really needs to be answered. Um, just about to be joined by Anne from Signs and Vision, um, and uh, then we are good to go. In fact, we'll uh, kick off, and Anne could join us as soon as she's ready. Yeah, and and just just to reiterate what you were saying, Ian, um, if there are if there is time at the end of the session this morning, and there are questions in the question panel that haven't been answered, then I will pose those to uh, members of the panel. But in the meantime, good morning and welcome to Dr. Alison Freighter who is going to kick us off this morning. Good morning, Alison. And you need to turn your microphone on. Oh, no. Um, well, thank you very much, Terry. <laughs> Sorry about that. And, and um, great to know that there's lots of people out there who want to know more about uh, coronavirus and, and what we're doing about it. So, so just to set the scene, I thought it would be useful just perhaps just to go back to some basic principles here. And... Just to say that, you know, we're talking about an infectious disease and, and most of our 
Infectious diseases are caused by bacteria and viruses, and actually uh, most of the ones that affect us are, are viruses. Um, and we're very familiar with the common cold, which is uh, affects us all, um, usually with a mild illness. And it's interesting to know that that is also a coronavirus. Um, a more serious uh, infectious disease uh, that we worry about a lot in the winter is, is flu. And, um, and, and that's an example where we know that it's more severe in older people. And we, so we vaccinate older people. And, and I think, you know, we begin to build up a picture here of how we tackle these diseases. You know, we, we understand what's going on. We begin to, we, we vaccinate. And actually we've also started recently vaccinating children uh, against flu because we know that uh, children are mixing with their grandparents. And so there's transmission there. So you begin to see how the kinds of policies that we're developing for managing this infectious disease begin to build up from our understanding. Um, so it's a system and we're all connected and we're all globally connected. And you'll have seen in the press issues to do with people bringing in different variants from overseas and so on. So, you know, we, we, we need to think about how we handle that. So we, we, we live very much in a global world and we're all interconnected with each other. And I think that's going to be a key principle that we'll talk about this morning throughout this, uh, this webinar. So moving then to um, the infectious disease we're talking about, which is COVID-19, um, this is an infectious disease caused by a newly discovered um, coronavirus called um, COVID-19, but also by its more technical name, which is SARS-CoV-2. Um, and again, for most people, for absolutely most people, they experience this as a mild to moderate illness. Um, but there are some people um, who, you know, some 15 to 20 percent of people who do experience much more severe symptoms. And, and we've seen that tragically that can also lead to some people's um, death. And that is something that we're experiencing as a society at the moment. So those people in which um, there is more severe illness are generally older people. So something like 95% of the deaths have been in older people. So that really puts it in context. You know, this is a, a disease which is much more severe in people over 60. And certainly as you, you age in the, in the decades, in 70, 80, you, you see a, a far higher um, death rate. Um, it does actually also, interestingly, seem to affect um, people with comorbidities. So anybody who's got conditions such as heart disease, asthma, uh, and so on. These kinds of diseases do seem to um, to sort of conspire in some ways with this infectious disease and create more severe illness uh, and, and worse symptoms for people. It also seems to affect uh, people from the Black African, Black Caribbean diaspora and from, the, from our Asian diaspora communities uh, and people in, in other sort of minoritized communities. And I think we're just beginning to understand why that is. I mean, clearly, you know, people who face discrimination or sort of bias in their lives do um, do face uh, greater issues associated uh, with that. That is a, an impact on people's health. And so there are some clearly some sort of systemic um, discrimination uh, concerns there that, that in, in many ways, I think, have, have really sort of come to the surface during this pandemic as something our society needs to address very urgently. We really need to, to get on top of why these things are happening. Uh, but that is of concern for us. And there's clearly also a sort of interrelationship there with, with people living in poverty or in areas of deprivation. So we have to worry about that. Um, there's also an issue which has been in the press lately about people with learning disabilities and other forms of disability do seem to have a higher risk of severe illness. So quite a lot, uh, quite a lot to think about there. So um, what's the best way to slow transmission of, of this infectious disease? And what do we know about that? And I think that the best way to answer that question in some ways is to say that it's all about knowledge. You know, it's what we know and actually what's been fantastic in this country certainly over the last year and, you know, clearly for many years beforehand, but there's been fantastic research and a real coming together of our research community with our policy and, um, and practice and certainly in sort of public health frontline leaders have really um, stimulated knowledge. Uh, they've expedited all of the sort of research that's going on, you know, really to, to understand how we can slow transmission. Uh, and so the first thing to say is that obviously for individuals, we know this is a respiratory illness that is uh, spread through 
droplets from the nose and through saliva by people coughing and sneezing. Um, and so it's back to those uh, personal infection control responsibilities that we all have, which is keeping our distance from other people. Space is the most important one of the three, actually. Uh, we, as we know more and more about this, um, this virus, we know that there are aerosol droplets that move through the air. So we do need to keep away from so that. Two meter distancing is so important. Um, we, we do also need um, to, uh, to think about hand washing and wearing face coverings where appropriate. I think what we're learning more and more about face coverings is that they really can reduce they really can reduce transmission. So very important to think about wearing, uh, you know, getting used to wearing a, a face covering and uh, and wearing that wherever it's indicated, but also, you know, you may want to anyway, because actually it can really reduce transmission. So that's, that's the sort of individual risk. But I think what we've also learned is that we need a really strong multi-agency response with the combined efforts of society. And we're really seeing that across the county in Hertfordshire. Everybody's involved, you know, the, the police, the fire service, the schools, the NHS, everybody really involved in, in delivering a fantastic response to this pandemic. So um, we've, we've got uh, our schools open uh, for key worker um, children and, and vulnerable children. And school teachers, I think, um, you know, from sort of working with them uh, myself over the last while, just been so impressed by how well they're managing the environment and really keeping uh, keeping uh, schools and ed other education settings COVID safe. Um, you know, so really, really looking at that. Um, and we'll talk more about the testing that, that we're taking forward and how that is for, um, uh, you know, how that will impact on young people as you go back to school. Um, and it works, you know, all of these efforts, uh, unfortunately, we do have to have a lockdown, we do, you know, have to restrict people's movements at the moment so that we can get this transmission down. And, and you know, once these viruses can't transmit, they, they do just sort of die away. So we will um, keep on that until we know that we've got very low figures. And in fact, it's working in Hertfordshire, and in fact, it's working across the country. We know that we've seen in our figures locally, uh, you know, a massive reduction in cases. We're really beginning to, to get on top of it. So um, you know, the numbers are right down, the numbers of deaths are right down, the numbers of cases going into, into, uh, into hospitals and seriously, um, those cases in, I, in ICU. We still do have these cases and we're, we're not beyond the levels we saw in September. So we're getting down the curve, but actually, um, you know, not as far as we want to go before we do fully um, feel that we're moving towards recovery. Now, of course, the important step forward that we've seen from December is this fantastic um, delivery of vaccine um, across um, across the country. And something like um, between sort of 13, 14 million people have now been vaccinated, which is mirrored in Hertfordshire. I think it's about um, it's about a quarter of the entire um, eligible population across the country, and it's a similar proportion in Hertfordshire. So a fantastic job of delivering that vaccine. So um, I think in conclusion, really, what we've learned and what our aims and hopes for the future are is that we combine what we're doing already with the infection control and the testing with our vaccination programme and that sort of three-pronged strategy will really take us forward into recovery. So really wanting your support and your engagement in helping us take that strategy forward, that three-pronged strategy, and everybody has a role to play. So just finally from me, um, there's that question on the end there, is where can young people find reliable information? And I think I'm interpreting that as you wanting information on, on the virus, because uh, others will talk about where you can find information locally about schools and mental health issues and so on. But there's some fantastic information on apps. The one I use is the Zoe COVID app from the University College London. It's fantastic. Um, gives loads of really decent information and very reliable and local. If you just put your postcode in, it tells you what's going on locally. Uh, and there's also information from the Mental Health Foundation, um, from, uh, from Hampshire County Council website, fantastic stuff on there, from the DfE, from the NHS website for young people. Look at the BBC, you know, really um, fantastic sources of information. So looking forward to talking to you more over the next hour. Thanks very much, Terry.
Thank you very much indeed, Alison. And can I just apologise to our, our friends who are, are watching for the um, little technical hiccup we had early on um, in getting Anne Malloy, um, our British Sign Language interpreter, back onto the screen. So I do sincerely apologise for that. Um, but thank you, Al thank you, Alison, very much. A very good start for this morning. Um, let's hand over now, please, to Liz Shapland, um, who will take us through the next steps. Good morning, Liz. Good morning, Terry. Thank you very much and welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Um, as Terry said first thing this morning, my name is Liz Shapland. I'm the Deputy Education Services Director for Hearts for Learning for Secondary. And practically what that means is that I work with schools and particularly focus a lot on, at the moment, GCSE and A-levels. And there have been a lot of questions that you've submitted regarding GCSE and A-levels and the curriculum generally. So I'm going to start off by talking about the impact on education and this is particularly relevant to those of you in year 11 and 13 but I know that we might have some people in year 10 and 12 who are um, tuned in today so I want to address that as well so if we look at the questions that you've submitted first of all we've got the first one which is about the update on the examinations and the results process and I know that most of your schools have written out to you and to your parents to explain what we know so far now interestingly we're a little bit earlier than the, perhaps the, the, the national announcement in terms of final decisions but there are some things we know so next week we know that Ofqual which is the organization that regulates all the exam boards and make sure that everything is fair will say what has been the result of their consultation in terms of the finer detail but there are some practicalities and some principles that won't change so the principles are these the first is that it will be based on teacher assessment and your school assessment of the standard at which you are performing. Now that's different from last year. Last year, your schools were asked to look at what people would um, have hoped to have got had the exams gone ahead. And what they're trying to do this year is to take account of the disruption that you've all suffered because of um, COVID-19. So it will be based, the centre of it will be teacher assessment, your school assessment, there won't be an algorithm, so there won't be any sense of adjustment centrally like there was last year. We know that because the Prime Minister has told us that. And we know that it will be evidence-based. So it will be based on a broad range of evidence, but that evidence will be chosen by your teachers and your schools, and it will be based on a sense of um an appropriate amount, but it will take into account some of the things that you've missed. So you won't be judged on things that you haven't studied, for instance. Okay, so it's very clear that it has to take account of time missed. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and I think we're going to head into the next question in a second, but actually it's about the mini tests. There's been a lot of news stories and media interest in this idea of the exams and the mini tests that Ofqual are proposing. And we don't know whether those will go ahead or not, and we won't know until next week. But if they do, they are not meant to be a separate exam. The, the chief regulator of call has said that they are only to be used to help teachers form an opinion on the evidence base. So they're to support the evidence, they're not the evidence on their own. So I hope that sort of allays some fears out there. For those of you in year 13 and and also in year 11 doing sort of what we call the non-examined assessment element, so in PE or art, etc. The, the plan is that that should go ahead and you should try to complete that if you can. And in terms of when the assessment will happen, Ofqual have said it should be as late as possible in the school year. So the plan is that you carry on working, you carry on being taught by your teachers, whether remotely or hopefully in school soon. And essentially that the whole plan is that actually we leave the assessment until the last possible moment so you have a chance to show your progress. We know that there should be some kind of appeal process and we don't know what that will look like if you're unhappy. And for those of you in year 13, we don't know if this will go ahead, but the plan is that perhaps you will get your results before your universities so that if there is a concern, you can choose to look at that with your school before your university turns you down. Okay, so actually we know lots of people lost their places last year 
year and then their grades were reinstated, but they still couldn't get their first choice. So that those are the general principles in terms of the, the GCSE and A-levels. And if we move on to your next question, oh, that, that's me moving on quickly. So is it possible for young people to choose to complete their GCSE and A-level exams instead of relying on the chosen system for grading? Because some young people feel this could be used to discriminate against them later in life. So we don't think that that's necessarily going to be the case. However, there was meant to be some, and there is meant to be some, provision for people who are private candidates. So if you've missed a lot of school and you actually entered yourself as a private candidate, that might be possible, but we're waiting to see the outcomes of that. The only time we think that will happen is for private candidates or potentially for people who sit our GCSEs from abroad. It's not meant to be a situation where schools will be able to put that in place for all students generally. And you know, if you have any questions about that, pop it in the question bar and I'll try to deal with that later. Okay, if we move on to question three now. Thank you. And I think I've already dealt with this one, but it's about the allowances that will be made uh, for young people whose grades have been impacted by COVID and about entrance grades for sixth form or college. And I think this is really important. The allowances that are made are meant to be um, built in for the grades anyway. So if you've missed, for instance, a whole section of your English course or your maths course, that should be taken into account when your teachers award your grade. And what the government will do is look at grades so that it is meant to be similar to the profile of previous years. So if you were aiming towards a grade five or grade seven, we would hope that that might happen as we move forward as well. So the allowances are built into the evidence base. In terms of school sixth form, I would say your schools know you best. And so if they think that you should have got that grade, they, they will talk to you about that. But remember, there will be no adjustments made centrally to the grades unless they talk to your school about that. And in terms of colleges and universities, again, I think they're expecting to be quite flexible about the entrance criteria based on what will happen um, with the grades this year. So I'm hoping that allays your fears, but I know that you know it is a real concern for many people but we would expect the results overall across the country not to change that much and then if we move on to the changes to exams impact on your future career choices and opportunities will it impact you forever we hope not we hope that actually the grades that you get will be um, representative of all of your years of education, not just the last year where you've been heavily disrupted. We know that the exam certificates won't indicate that um, it's different and that actually you might have had a reduced examination because of the situation. So therefore, as long as your schools have an evidence base and they can look at what you have achieved in the time that you've been with them and online and working remotely, then hopefully your grades will be everything that you hope they should be. The thing that I have to say to you, and your schools would expect me to say this, is the most important thing you can do right here, right now, is to carry on working, listen to your teachers and build up that evidence base so that your teachers have a broad range of evidence to, 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 to choose and select from. And then finally from me, um, there's one that's not necessarily about GCSE and A-levels, but it is about the curriculum, so it does fall into to my area. And it's actually about Black Lives Matters in the conversation. Now, we know that, you know, that the whole conversation about Black Lives Matters came about because of the, the awful situation in, in the States and the protests. And uh, quite rightly, schools and government and all sorts of organisations have actually started looking at their processes. And I think what's really important is that this can't be an initiative. It can't be a one-off assembly. It has to be something that schools have built into everything that they do. So what's really important is that 
schools are looking at their curriculum, that they're actually looking at how um, their curriculum reflects all of society in a cosmopolitan society, that Black Lives Matters and all the implications are built into recruitment processes in schools, and most importantly, that schools listen to young people and respond to young people. And at Hearts for Learning, what we're trying to do is work with your schools to make sure that that becomes a really key part of school review and structure um, and curriculum design as we move forward. And at this point, I think that's the end of my questions. And I'm hoping to bring in Tanya from Hearts County Council. And I think what I will do is if there are any questions in the questions bar or the chat bar, I'll pick those up hopefully at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Welcome, Tanya. Hello, um, and uh, um, thank you for everybody that is uh, joining here today. Um, my name is uh, Tanya Wall. I'm Head of School Standards and Accountability um, in the Education Department in the Local uh, Education Authority. And what that means is I work with schools and with uh, parts for learning, so people like Liz, to ensure that our schools are offering the best education possible. However, in the last year or so, what I've been doing is working very closely with public health colleagues like Dr. Alison Freighter and other colleagues um, to ensure that our schools are, um, have all the support they need to uh, keep, keep students and staff safe during the COVID and making sure that they're you know, putting in place all the infection control measures that they need to. Um, I have a number of questions that we're going to um, click through, um, <clears throat> uh, which have come in from all of you, which has been really helpful. A lot of them are around on devices, and I know there's been a question in the question tab already um, about what is happening, what is being done by HCC to help disadvantaged young people who don't have access to laptops or good internet so they can tend on online classes. Now, um, the Department for Education has uh, been issuing devices across the country to schools. And in Hertfordshire, we have, last count, we have, Hertfordshire schools have received nearly 7,000 laptops. That's about 6,700 laptops for, that have gone to schools um, to for students who don't have access to the laptop. This also includes, we received, <coughs> uh, Hertfordshire schools received an awful lot of routers at the beginning of the term. So there is that support going forward as well. We also know that some local companies have been working with directly with schools and have approached in the local education authority and we put them in touch with schools to uh, provide um, recycled laptops or, or reworked laptops schools. And I know many schools have been taking advantage of that. Um, it's really interesting that we've, we're, we're getting those questions because the, what would be a really good view is, is maybe in the chat and in the questions about whether or not you are receiving access to laptops where, where you might not have, have them. Um, and that would be good for us to get a kind of sense of what's going on actually on the ground. Okay, can you flip the next slide, please, Ian? Um, and the next question is also relevant to the online um, accessibility for schools. Would it be okay, would it be possible for non-key worker, frontline worker children who don't have access to internet and laptops to attend school? Absolutely, yes. So the government's guidance on who can attend school during lockdown is for children of critical workers. And um, the, terminate, uh, the terminology they use is vulnerable children, which is a bit of a sort of misnomer because it includes children um, with a EHCP, but it also includes children that... Um, have don't have access to a laptop or internet at home um, and that is for the for the pure reason to be able to come into school and be able to receive those lessons i know some schools have brought in children for a period of time but then have got their um delivery of uh laptops and have been able to provide those laptops to children um so they can continue working at home but yes, if you don't have access, currently have access to a device or secure internet, you should be able to attend school. And if you're, if that's not happening, you should have a con conversation with your school as, as, as soon as you can. Okay, next question. Uh, now this is this is a um, 
a difficult question and I might ask Liz to help me with this one as well. Um, what do I do if I've lost all motivation to do the subjects that I don't want to pursue? Now, this is going to be a challenge for many of the uh, many, many young people across the country. To be honest, it's sometimes a bit of a challenge for me when I'm, I'm trying to work at home constantly. And uh, it, it's it's a real challenge. So my advice here and Liz, if you've got any advice about how, how you can work, uh, how children can, uh, how students can work uh, through timetables, that would be great. But my advice is to keep in contact with your school, your head, head of year, your form tutor and help develop yourself a timetable and uh, work through that timetable but in the first instance talk to your teachers at school about how you're feeling what your motivation is and how that's in, and how the current situation is affecting your motivation and and get your teachers to help and support you as much as possible during during this period liz did you want to add anything liz may have a uh, connection trouble so we'll, we'll pop on to the the next question Now, I was asked this earlier today in a meeting and my answer was, I don't know. So will all students return to school or will it only be certain year groups? Um, government haven't uh, announced their plans for return of schools and we expect the Prime Minister to make an announcement on Monday, Monday the 26th, 22nd of November, 22nd of February. Um, my anticipation is that uh, the younger children will go back first and with a more staggered um, return for secondary aged children um, but in all honesty until the prime minister makes it to now his announcement on monday or um, early next week we don't know but i think that will be the safest way um, to bring children back a staggered response particularly in secondary um, education um, and potentially a rotor system so there, there will be I'm sure there will be a delayed response a uh, delayed return for some secondary children um, and I, I, my, I anticipate that it will the first uh, year groups that will come back are those year groups that are taking or will be assessed for exams at the end of uh, this year so year 11 and year 13. Okay, do we want to go to the next question? Um, when can I play team sports? Why can professional clubs play but we can't when we know it's good for us? Now, this is a really important question. Um, grassroots football, uh, grassroots sports and uh, school sports are on hold until a uh, further announcement from government. So we in the uh, announcement from the Prime Minister that we expect on Monday about schools reopening and how schools will reopen. We also expect um, an announcement in that to be made about uh, return of um, grassroots sports, including school sports. So until we have that, we don't know. Um, why can professional clubs play? But we, uh, it's it's simply down to uh, infection control uh, measures, which are easier to implement in the large in in in, in professional clubs than, than perhaps it is in some of the grassroots clubs. Okay, is that my last question? Okay, so that's um, that's my last question. I know there's some questions coming in on the uh, tab and, some quest uh, and and through the chat. So we'll aim to continue to answer that then. But uh, in the meantime, I'll bring back Dr. Anne Freyta, who will uh, talk about some of the infection control measures that schools are using and, and which schools will be using. Thanks, Tanya, that's great. Okay. Um, in fact, I've just been asked a question in the chat, which I was just um, typing away answering, uh, but I think it's one of the questions that we had sent in earlier. So, um, Ethan Yardley, who asked that question, I think you might find that um, I'm going to answer your question now anyway, but I'll certainly put it in the chat as well. Um, in fact, funnily enough, um, Tanya, I wonder whether you want to answer this one. It's partly because, you know, I, I do think um, you know, quite a lot of what's been done sort of through the school's route is something that you, you perhaps know more about than me on this particular question. So I'm, I th I'm just going to ask you to come back in and have a look at that one. Okay, so that's COVID-19 has forced young people into isolation in many cases where 
they may struggle to integrate back in society. What support has been put in place in this? Now, there is there's huge amount of support in terms of supporting young people's mental health. Um, through schools, of mental health and wellbeing, through schools, your first port call should be schools. But we've also got the Just um, Talk Hearts website, um, which is provided, you know, which is the, uh, providing the, the uh, um, framework for the, this webinar. Um, and uh, Terry mentioned the uh, website at the beginning of uh, the webinar. I would encourage you to go and use those resources and continue talking to your pastoral support care or your head of year at school. Um, there has been a lot of um, support come from government to schools um, in the, uh, I can't quite remember what it's called, it's emotional um, wellbeing support for schools. Um, government provided a, a grant to all schools um, to support the well-being of young people on return to school back in last term, and that has been extended and continued. So, school and Just Talk Hearts is probably your first port call for that support, and they're very well equipped to help. Thanks very much, Tanya. Um, let me just come back to. Um, this was the question I was referring to that had come into the chat. Um, the, the, the question in the chat is actually in some ways more helpful. It sort of says what will be done to make our schools safe uh, from coronavirus when they reopen and what's being done differently from what you experienced um, last term. And actually the, the major difference I think is that we have introduced rapid testing um, for people who may have infection but aren't actually showing any symptoms yet. So, you know, they don't think they've got it, and so they wouldn't go for a test, um, you know, um, with, with symptoms. So we're introducing these tests, and the good thing about these tests is that they give you a result really quickly. And so, you know, it's, it's really possible to, you know, maybe um, take a test when you return to school, and I think the policy that we did have, uh, if schools had been going to return fully after Christmas, was that um, in secondary schools, people would take two tests on return to school, probably three to five days apart. Um, the test is very simple. It, it Obviously, because we're talking about a respiratory illness here that affects your nose and your throat, you know, causes all those horrible sort of um, flu-like symptoms, uh, is that you have to put a swab in into the back of your throat uh, and uh, into your nose. And that just goes into a little reagent uh, and then it, it it slips into um, a sort of plastic cylinder and it, it gives you a result as a line on that on that sort of cylinder on a plastic cylinder it's a bit like a, a pregnancy test if you're familiar with how those work mm -hmm. it just gives you a sort of a line that says whether or not the test is is positive or not um, now i'm not going to pretend that this test is a uh, completely pleasant. Um, it's not. It, you have to put the swab gently onto your tonsils and sort of rotate it a few times to get some saliva, you know, some saliva from there. But actually, um, and it can make you sort of want to gag a bit, you know, so it's, it's pretty hideous. But, but I mean, you know, we're talking a couple of seconds here, uh, you know, just a few seconds to get that, uh, that swab down there. Uh, but fantastic results, very quick. Uh, and if you're positive from that test, uh, you will be asked to isolate for 10 days and your close contacts will have to isolate with you. We're talking about secondary schools here because the rules are slightly different for, for primary schools uh, and early years. And I'll go through those in a moment. So what will the testing look like in schools? Well, your schools have set up... Um, while most of you have been away from school, they've set up a fantastic hub inside the school. A lot of them are in your sports halls or in your, uh, you know, in sort of big spaces in the school. Um, they will do some training with you, show you how to do it, uh, you know, what kind of process they've put in place so that, you know, you, you take the test. It takes about half an hour for that little line to come up on the cylinder. And so some schools are asking you to go back to class while that... Um, you know, it kind of develops, if you like, uh, and then you go back uh, and enter your result onto um, a, the computerised system so that your result goes up to Public Health England so that we can keep track of how many people have had a test and what the positivity, positive results are from that so that we can 
keep a track on how much positive COVID we've got in our schools. But importantly, people are, um, you know, obviously if you're positive, uh, you, you'd be asked not to come up to school um, for those 10 days uh, and your close contact. So we're take, taking the infection out. Um, it, it, the question here is also asking about uh, face coverings and socially distancing. And yes, please. And let's just think of this as our, you know, hopefully, as I said earlier, we're optimistically looking forward to recovery, but we really need that last sort of push on this. We do need you to wear face coverings where you're asked to do so and to socially distance when you return to school. So, you know, make sure, and ventilation is so important, hand washing every couple of hours or so, and certainly when you're changing settings, moving between um, different settings. So let's just, you know, kind of really do that as public health citizens, if you like, and, and just get that, uh, you know, let's get this infection uh, behind us. So uh, I don't know whether I've got any other questions on my thing here. Um, yeah, what can we, um, Sorry, easy to do. What can and can't we do safely, especially if we're trying to shield older family members? Well, I think it, it's so important, as I said earlier, that we recognise that we live in this very interconnected world. We've we've got to look after older people, and uh, we do know that um, we do know that COVID nineteen uh, is a more severe disease in many older people, especially people with comorbidities. So, please keep to the lockdown rules. Look on the on the government website so that you're keeping up to date with the rules. Let's um, you know. Let's make sure that we uh, communicate with our older family members through other means. Use your you know your laptops. Write to them. You know, my mother doesn't use any kind of social media, so we're regularly writing to her and using the telephone. Um, and and again, you know, once you uh, once the lockdown is over, of course you can see your friends. But let you know. Let's stick to the rules. If we're asked to only see one friend, uh, or go for a walk where we're outside, we're socially distancing. Let's keep to those rules until we're told that we can see more people, or we can begin to, you know, lockdown uh, eases, and we can begin to say maybe one or two friends, and then we can see more. You know, let's just stick to those rules because honestly, that would be the quickest and safest way for us to move forward and get out of this um, situation. Alison, uh, and, carry on. Sorry, sorry. You carry on. Oh, I was just going to say about holidays. Um, again, you know, we have to wait for the government to uh, lift the restrictions, certainly on holidays abroad, uh, because you know we we're very clear what's going on in our own country. But there are risks of going abroad, and you know, perhaps bringing back those variants that we we don't want to see. And that you know, the the se the secret to reducing the variants is to reduce transmission. Because if we reduce transmission, the COVID isn't multiplying, it isn't developing, it's stuck. So let's just reduce those variants. Um, I I do. My understanding from government is that we may be able to go on some holidays um, inside the country. Uh, you know, perhaps as we move towards uh, a much firmer. Um, lower numbers uh, of, of COVID, you know, where the incident rate is really beginning to get right down there. Uh, but let's wait for uh, government to give us the guidance on that. And you can get that on the gov.uk and in fact, on the Hertfordshire County Council website. Uh, Alison, I, I just, oh, you've got another question. So you well, you know, do go ahead, um, Terry, I can no, no, answer this one. After you. After you. Uh, well, I think, um, uh, I think Tanya answered this question, Terry, actually earlier. She was talking quite a lot about, you know, the importance of um, of engaging with your schools, looking at you know, your schools counsellors, um, you know, to 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 seek that, you know, to seek a discussion about those kinds of worries and don't bottle them up. Make sure that you really do talk to people. It's so important, um, you know, to to share. Uh, your feelings, we're all feeling anxious, um, you know, so do share those feelings uh, and, you know, your school is your first point of call, but there's also, again, on the HCC website, that Just Talk um, uh, web address will, you know, put you in touch with people who, who can come back and talk with you. Um, so, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's all work together on this. And the, and the issue about ensuring our teachers' mental health, what a great question that is. I mean, it's fantastic that we're thinking about others and that we're really engaging uh, you know, with understanding that it's not just ours, you know, we need to work with teachers and support them. And, you know, I mean, I promise you as a public health consultant, I'm so impressed with how well your teachers are doing. So, you know, give them that support, tell them, you know, how grateful you are for what they're doing. Thanks, Terry. Did you want to come back in then? Well, I, I was 
actually your question the last question that you just answered i was, I was going to sort of ask a, a very similar question insofar as um i happened to see a program on tv on bbc uh, a couple of nights ago where uh, they had the duke of cambridge and peter crouch and uh, others footballers and so on and they were talking about the the anxiety and the stress and thinking i'm stressed but i don't want to tell anybody else because that person may not think they're stressed and it is actually very much a sharing thing and 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 not being afraid to mm. talk to someone that's where just talk comes in because you may be helping yourself but equally you you may well be helping others as well and that applies equally to to teachers and i think the other thing i would also say which picked up on something that tanya was saying is that it's actually much easier to introduce a lockdown because you say right everything is going to shut it is very much more difficult as we found out before to actually mm -hmm. relax lockdown because there becomes areas of gray areas and can you do this can you do that and so that's i think one of the reasons why um we are looking at a, a careful um progress back to mm. as much quality as we can get but um i think that the stress to say um, you're not alone and we understand is very important and just talk is so important thank you absolutely um there's a couple of questions will the budget be reduced due to nearly 10 percent shrinkage in the economy um well i think i can probably answer that one and and that is that so far as education is concerned schools are funded by um schools are funded by the uh, the dedicated schools grant and that is protected um so that's that's an important element but i don't know whether tanya wants to uh, come back in um on that particular point because i've lost my, i've lost the questions link at the moment i'm just coming back in so um just picking up that question will the council budget be reduced to really the shrinkage in the economy and if so will this lead to cutting back of local public services i'm not sure that tanya is um, there at this precise moment um, um and I'm, Alison, do you do you want to say anything at all about the funding, um, particularly within the public health sector? I mean, what what is also fair to say is that Hertfordshire. I know it doesn't relate specifically to young people specifically, but um, Hertfordshire has allocated via the central government uh, funding uh, over 130 million pounds since the beginning of the lockdown, um, and indeed um, we're about to enter the um holiday activities fund where we've been given about 2.75 million pounds to uh, assist people during the summer holidays the easter holidays and going forward um to engage in some activities which will keep people um active um engaged and and not not sitting at home um because i'm also very aware that for a number of people and i don't want to sound too gloomy about this there there are many people who who have got a house with a garden there's equally an awful lot of people who are living in apartments um, where they don't necessarily have access to to green space to run around in and 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 i know how much they are going to enjoy being able to get out into the open again absolutely no i've been fantastically impressed with, with how much resource has been made available and how that you know what the process is within the council for really sort of getting that out into uh, into ways to support the community and the area that i'm involved with we talked earlier about the testing in schools uh, and that program you know has been up and running secondary schools we're now taking it forward also in the primary schools um, and in some of the, the, the maintained uh, early years and the schools-based nurseries. So that's, that's all sort of coming together. Uh, and there's a big plan to develop testing across, um, uh, across the county for key workers, uh, for workplaces that have more than 50 people, for building a community testing hub, um, lots of work going into, into uh, mental health issues. We were talking just yesterday actually about, you know, community um, organizations being resourced to provide support to people in the community you know for all ages a huge amount of work for um, older people for uh, in supporting care homes um, lots of uh, information going out um, you know all sorts of support uh, you know for our shops for COVID marshals in high streets to 
make sure that people are aware of the, the, the restrictions on, on lockdown and so on. You know, massive amount of, um, of information and support for people. Uh, I don't know whether Tanya can come back in. I could hear you earlier, Tanya, but maybe if I maybe if I oh, yes. it at this point, then it might be easier. Can you, okay. can you hear me now, Alison? Yeah. I can hear you, yeah, really well, Tanya. Okay, so I've just started typing an answer to Henry in in the in the question about the funding, um, uh, the funding question. Um, I can't comment on wider local government um, uh, budgets, but uh, funding for schools, th there may well be a possibility that some there may be some declining funding, but I think it's also quite likely the government will invest. Um, in education, uh, particularly around catch-up um, funding um, to support uh, students to uh, to um, to catch up uh, their learning after losing so, losing so much learning over the last year, the government has recently announced that they have extended the catch-up premium funding, and uh, this is and I can't remember exactly how much money it is, but it it, it is a lot of money. It's in it's in the billions for schools to support students' um, uh, continued learning and get them to a position to, to catch them up over the, the last year or so. And that is through um, additional tutoring and additional support at school. So that's been extended. So um, I, uh, and you may have heard on the news today that um, the Anne Longfield, the uh, Children's Commissioner, has been um, uh, campaigning and lobbying government for additional funding to support education and children's students going forward because of this last year the challenges with education this last year and i don't know whether um uh whether liz is back on stage but i do know that hearts for learning have been operating and running a, a, a scheme called back on track which was designed to uh, get people um back up to if you like back up to speed but here is liz so um liz, do you want to pick up I hope you heard what uh, Tanya was saying, and perhaps you can pick up from that from an, from the um, Hearts for Learning perspective. Yes, absolutely. So we've had a back on track um, package, lots of that for primary schools as well, in terms of supporting schools to look at where students perhaps have, have not made quite the progress we wanted or where things have been a little bit more difficult to, to get to grips with at home. And we've had a secondary version of that in science and English and maths, maybe called something slightly different, but it's the same principle. And what we've been doing is working with our schools to say, how can we see what students have done because many students have worked really hard during lockdown as indeed have their teachers with them and they've done some great work but actually how can we make sure that we fill those gaps or the areas that need perhaps a little bit more teacher input face to face um, when people get back um, to school and so there's been some intervention support uh, and also looking at how we might have some individual tuition or small group work so that people can catch up. Terry, there are a couple of questions that I started to answer in, in the chat, in the question bar. Would you just like me to quickly deal with those now that are GCSE based? Yes, please. Um, so one was about um, mocks. Now, I think I've answered that. It was about um, do, do all students have to do mocks and are they mandatory? And it's up for schools to decide whether they, they run mocks when people return. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen with these mini tests that Ofqual are talking about. But if schools do run mocks, it will be to look at where perhaps you need a little bit of extra teaching, a little bit of extra support to help get that evidence base sorted. It won't just be to say, well, well this is your grade. This, that's what we're expecting to see, perhaps what, what people have secured. There's a question about year 10 and year 12 and what will happen to them. And we know at this moment in time that the government is hoping that exams will go ahead next year, but we would expect that to happen with some amendments, maybe a contingency framework, and much the same as was proposed this year with perhaps a reduction in the number of exams or some of the content. Um, and then there's a question about whether the curriculum might become more coursework based. And we know that this is maybe an opportunity for the government to think about whether exams are the only way of measuring assessment and, and measuring progress. And actually what we might 
um, see is, is some move going forward, but we, we, we don't know the answers at this moment in time. And there's also a question about year seven having missed a lot. And I think there, there is a concern that perhaps people feel they've missed ever such a lot through being in school. But I would say our evidence is that teachers and students have done such a lot of good work during lockdown and remotely that I think that schools are well placed to identify what needs to happen going forward. And certainly if you're in year seven, there's certainly a lot of time with your teachers to make sure you can catch up. And Liz, that, that leads very nicely into a question from Nadia, uh, who says, will virtual lessons continue after lockdown? Yeah, we, we certainly expect that to happen. Um, certainly revision lessons, catch up lessons. I think those of us that are used to snow days where we woke up and saw all the snow outside and thinking, oh, the school might be closed today. I don't think that's going to happen going forward anymore because we're all set up for remote learning. So I think there will be some and there'll certainly be some revision support going forward. Um, but certainly we, we would expect um, some of the best of what's happened during remote learning and, and lockdown. To, to continue going forward. Thank and you. If uh, I can, Terry, if I can just add to that, I've just I've just answered Nadia's email in the uh, in the question. I think for I think Liz is right. There will be a um, will be capturing schools will be capturing some of the best of what's been happening in virtual learning. But I think for the foreseeable future, the next term and uh, perhaps um, going forward for an, another few terms, we will see a blended approach to learning uh, with a mixture of face-to-face -face lessons and online lessons. So it will be with us for a while, but it will, but as Liz says, it will be picking the best of what we've learned through uh, implementing virtual learning very quickly. Uh, Lucy Wilder uh, asked a question and uh, she's repeated it and she's had a, a fair bit of uh, traction um, from others saying, what's the whole point of year 11 going back as they have missed the two main years so far? And us going back will make it rise like it did last time when school started. Who would like to pick that one up, Liz or Tanya? Shall I start, uh, Tanya? Do you want to do the statutory part, and then I'll do the uh, the other part of it? Yeah. Who blinks second? <laughs> so, um, well, the statutory part is that. Do, students should be returning to school and schools have a statutory responsibility to bring back year 11 students. So that's the law, but your question isn't about the law. Your question is about what's the point? Is there any use going back? Which um, I think Liz will, I mean, I would say there is a strong point, absolutely. And there is, uh, there is use going back and there will be lots of support, but Liz can answer that more um, fully. OK, so if you're in year 11, absolutely, your schools want you back. And the reason they want you back is because if we can, looking at the evidence base, there, there are certain things that I know your teachers are doing a great job, but there's a reason that we have schools and the reason we all go to school. And that's because actually teaching and learning is more than just you doing work through a laptop it's about the group work it's about the interaction it's about the social element it's about schools reflecting what society is about and if you can go back and if we are allowed to looking at the evidence that you have in front of you with your teachers being able to look at what you've achieved and what you might still need to do before those final assessments are made is really important and I think actually it's important to think about the non-examination elements about meeting up with friends meeting up with your teachers and actually thinking about what schools do there. Schools reflect society and it's really important that where possible we get you back as quickly as possible. And I think it will also help with transition, whether you're going to sixth form or whether you're going to college. And actually being able to do that in school is better, we hope, than actually doing it online. So, yes, we want you back as quickly as possible. Thank you very much indeed, Liz. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions and we're just about on a one hour. Um, so before I ask um, everybody to, to uh, thank our presenters, um, Liz and Tanya um, and Alison will be familiar with a phrase an, or an old adage that I frequently use, which is necessity is the mother of invention. And here we are, we're in a situation where the world and our life has been very, very different in the last 12 months or more than that. 
but it is an opportunity for people to think creatively and to think how they can do things differently. There's there's opportunities for people, particularly young people with technology skills or ideas to actually jump on and, and create something that's really exciting and really inspirational. And it doesn't have to be academic. It can be um, with your hands, with your, your, your um, art, your, your culture, your creativity. But there is no there is no place that isn't accessible to you. And I absolutely wish you all every success in that. And that might sound a bit sort of hooky, but that is as a as a father and indeed as a grandfather that you can tell by the colour. Um, the, that that is something that I hold very dear. So what <laughs> I, I've just I've just sent Anna into paroxysms about the colour of my hair, which is very worrying. Um, can I now thank Alison, Liz, Tanya and Anne and everyone who have asked the questions and the technical team behind the scenes um, who for a one one or two moments have sort of uh, um, had, had, to had to probably resort to a gin and tonic, but, but for their support um, in organising and running the session. There was a question earlier on about will there be another one. I would like to think there probably will be at some stage in the future, but we have to do it when there is something positive um, to, to, to support you with going forward. Um, can I just also remind you um, that the details of the support services and the links to reliable COVID-19 information sources can be found at www.justtalkhearts.org. So that's www.justtalkhearts.org should you need to. Don't be afraid to use it. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, it's not quite sunny, but it looks as though it's going to be a reasonable day. And so I say thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Good afternoon.